Well, hello and welcome to the Institute of Health and Social Care Management's fabulous Integrated Care Conference. Before we start, I'm going to hand on to Richard Strong, who's going to say a couple of words of introduction on behalf of today's guest, which is Matthew Gould. Richard, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome everyone to this Integrated Care Conference. Um, I'm really delighted that we're uh, associated with this and in the Institute of Healthcare Management. Um, it's wonderful to have Matthew here um, talking about this, uh, this topic. Integrated care is obviously key to future healthcare, I think, and IT uh, and data supporting that is uh, really important for us um, to help the NHS. So really delighted to be supported. And Roy tells me I've now got to introduce him as the doyen of, of, of this uh, opportunity. So Roy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, good morning and welcome to everybody. Well, we're looking forward to a great conference today. And of course, this is about us all working closer together. And uh, key to that, of course, will be how we can share data and integrate our IT systems. That's the big chunk, I think. And uh, we're going to get uh, straight into that with Matthew. Matthew, uh, Happy New Year. Thank you. And Here's hoping for a slightly uh, less stressful 2021. I, uh, listen, anything less stressful will do on the Richter scale of stress. I can't imagine how busy you are. It's been a horrendous uh, year for you. Right, well, let's crack on because um, uh, I've got an eye on the time. Um, I, I, the, the fun, the centrepiece, I, I guess, Matthew, uh, in your sort of a repertoire is the shared care record which is a key to moving the health and social care uh, spheres closer together. Um, originally, of course, before we knew we were going to be uh, beaten up by COVID, we thought that uh, September was a good end date to get all this up and running. Uh, I mean, what, what's your view? Is, is that still your target date? Um, so, yes and no. It's the answer. Yes, we want everyone to have a minimum level of uh, shared care uh, across the country by September. No, we're clearly not going to have everyone going all the way we want them to go by then. I mean, this is putting in a shared care record is not straightforward. Part of it's about tech. A lot of it is about trust, about people, about sorting out the IG. Um, so we're realistic. We will. We do want to. We're working to to make sure we have some a minimum threshold. We want to get everyone over by then. But that will be the end of the first chapter, not the end of the book. So it's going to be a continuing journey. But I mean, I do think it is really important, and I think the pandemic has showed us this that the ability for data to flow between care settings, between GPs and hospitals, between health and social care, makes a really material impact to, to outcomes and to, to, to what happens to, to patients. And so continuing to drive this agenda is absolutely vital. I, I agree. I mean, yeah, I, I recall right at the beginning of uh, lockdown and COVID, you know, all those months ago, you sent out that very helpful data that, you know, I'm paraphrasing this, you didn't exactly say this, but you said, look, don't worry about GDPR, just be sensible about the use of data, use it wisely and just get on and do stuff. And I, I have to say, in all my years of the NHS, I've never seen a, a more helpful memo to come out, of, uh, come out of the Kremlin. So, I mean, you've... <laughs> You've had a kind of fairly relaxed uh, attitude to that. Now, that waiver, I think, does that end on the 31st of March? So um, it's worth separating out sort of what happened here, because um, the truth is uh, it wasn't a waiver from GDPR. GDPR continued all the way through. What it was, though, was, uh, I mean, I had a, a re right at the start of this, I had a conversation with Elizabeth Denham, the information commissioner. And she was, I mean, really determined to make sure that unnecessary worries about um, IG didn't get in the way of clinicians saving lives. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't saying the law doesn't apply. What it said was effectively, 
um, the law accepts, GDPR accepts that in certain circumstances, um, people have to make very difficult decisions and the regulator has a margin of um, discretion um, and that she was very clear as long as if you were a nurse or a doctor and you were dealing with your patients and their data in good faith and sensibly and you were trying to look after them, then she could see no circumstance where any enforcement action would be taken. And for me, that was, I mean, a fantastic opportunity to send out something super clear. And we've tried to capture that in uh, the portal. We've set up a, an online portal with really easy to use in, uh, guidance on IG for IG experts, for clinicians, for members of the public, endorsed by the ICO and NHS Digital and the National Data Guardian. So people don't have to worry they're getting conflicting guidance from lots of different places. So it's, it's something I want to keep, which we can do within the current law. We are also looking at how we can capture through legislative change the best bits of the emergency regulations, the so-called COPE notices um, that have applied since the start of a pandemic. And that um, they do have a expiry date. We've been rolling them on as the pandemic has continued. So some of it, it makes sense to, to go back to where we were before because it's only appropriate for a public health emergency. But there are some elements and we're working out what they should be where it will also make sense to, uh, to, to, to embed them in uh, regular law because they've served, um, the, um, served health so well while maintaining patient privacy. Right. And that leads me into the data sharing agreement that you published. Um, I mean, that's not so much a, an agreement, is it? It's more of a template for people to follow. Is that how you see it? Um, I mean, I think it's a, what we're doing is a combination of um, providing people with guidance and really clear guidance so a lot of this is is not about changing the rules it's simply about giving people templates clear guidance and um very straightforward simple advice so you don't need a phd in data protection law to to navigate it it's about changing the rules where they need to be changed um, and we're looking at what they should be in consulting and we're very keen to get it right. Um, and, and I don't think, just to be clear, I don't think there is a balance, a trade-off between using data effectively and privacy. You should be able to do both if you get this right. Um, and then thirdly is the, the, the tech underpinning where, again, we're, we're working with systems with uh, suppliers um, to make sure that we make this as easy as possible for systems to set up the, 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 the data sharing that we think needs to happen, that I think everyone knows needs to happen. It, well, we do, and it's long overdue. And this, I mean, this looks as though it's going to be a, a real game changer. But, you know, I, I'm left wondering, really, if... Excuse me. Do do we need really a shared care agreement? Um, all we want to do is to get access to each other's data to see, you know, what Mrs. Brown's meds are or what her visits are from her uh, domiciliary service. And, you know, the practical sleeves rolled up day to day stuff. Could we not accomplish that without all this palaver simply by sharing login arrangements between one organization and another? I think they call it mutualizing password access. I mean, is that not a simpler route? So, look, I mean, I'm up for avoidance of palaver. Um, there's this is an area where there is there's shed loads of palaver, and the less of it, the better. And I'm up for any bright idea and any way of doing it 
which is quick and effective. Um, so I'm certainly have a look at that. Um, what's clear though is the trust and the relationships and the, the willingness for people to put their faith into what's been set up is as important as what's been set up. I mean, I was very struck very early on in my tenure that going to see a hospice where there were they needed to get access to GP records and the technical ability was there, but it needed the GPs to allow it. And they told me that a, a high proportion of GPs didn't, not for bad reasons, but because they'd been had it drilled into them so much that if you screw up on data, you're in big trouble, that they did the rational thing, which was to default to taking no risk. We have to find a way to give people confidence that not only can they, but they are under a duty to share. And I'm up for any mechanism that allows us to do that. But we need to bring people with us and, and make clear to them that there is a Caldecott principle around the duty of sharing, just as much as there is a Caldecott principle around the necessity to preserve patient privacy. Well, it's a common law duty, isn't there, of confidentiality? And that that kind of underpins all the other layers of palaver uh, that have been built on this. Yeah, and that's why I think it's sensible to look at the law. Um, but the truth is, even with the law entirely as, as it is at present, a lot more sharing is possible than is currently done. Under law, sharing for direct care is uh, absolutely okay, as long as it's done sensibly and safely. And the Caldecott principles make clear that sharing for direct care is a duty, not just something, not just a something you can do potentially. Well, let's, I just want to um, perhaps uh, flesh this out uh, a bit more, just move beyond that, because then we get into the issue of procurement. Uh, you know, the, there will be a lot of companies who will be interested in providing the the technological background the you know the software to do shared care and interface software and all the rest of it where do, how we how are we doing on um uh, on the procurement side of things because uh, you got the hssf uh, procurement uh, which i think most people have welcomed but then you've got on top of that you've had epic who are you know a well-known organization who who are, have been selling outside that framework and trusts have, have bought their product you know for you know good it's not for me to talk about whether it's a good thing or not but but it does somehow or other kind of undermine the framework agreements to get this stuff done um so look i mean you're talking about the uh, hssf uh, framework for EPRs, and you're right, Epic isn't on it and has nonetheless sold to a number of places. HSSF isn't a compulsory framework. It's meant to be helpful for those who want to use it. Um, what I would say, though, is on this, as in a number of areas, we're trying to set up, or we're not trying, we are setting up a procurement framework um, to make it much easier to uh, to procure much easier and faster. So what we've done for remote monitoring, for example, or uh, most recently for technology to share images between high street opticians and ophthalmology clinics is we've set up dynamic purchasing frameworks that bring the uh, procurement time down from six months to a few weeks. Uh, so if you want to go out and buy blood pressure monitors, you don't have to spend six months doing it. You can do it really quickly, knowing that we've set up a procurement uh, framework. Everyone on it is compliant because we've done the homework for you. OK, that's the approach we want to take with this. OK, so where are we with the shared care record in terms of procurement? So we're building that procurement framework um, and we'll get it out soon. We're working out what with the uh, minimum um requirement in terms of data sharing should be for us to reach by September we're working out the uh resource offer to systems so that we can help them and we're going we're working out the data architecture so we make sure that when we build it we build it in a way which helps um 
the movement of data around the system overall, rather than creating a tech legacy that we're going to have to fight in the future. Yes, I mean, that's a, a, a really important point, Matthew, isn't it? Because all of this is going on. Well, we're talking about this, you know, we're focusing on the shared care record and, and all that. But actually, there's a whole swirl of other change that's going on that we're, we're sort of forgetting because of COVID and all the other stuff that's happening at the moment. But uh, we've got integrated care services that are coming in. Very important structural change in the NHS. None of that will work, really, unless there is an integrated uh, use of data. And that includes social care that thus far in all, you know, all my years in the NHS has been sort of annexed to the health service. And, and clearly, if we've learned anything from COVID, it, it is that they have to be working much closer with us. Now, that creates, you know, a political issue and a funding issue. But from the technical point of view, what do you see that the integrated care framework the drivers that have come out of COVID, do you see any of that really as, as changing the digital framework or your approach to it? Yeah, massively. And I think one of the really heartening things that's happened in recent weeks for me, from a, a sort of narrow perspective, has been the guidance coming from NHS England to systems has digital and data in the headlines, woven all the way through it, and a really strong digital and data section in it. So no one reading the guidance about what it means to be an ICS can come away with any view other than ICSs need to use digital and data to offer genuinely integrated care. And uh, getting digital in from the start rather than as an afterthought, uh, for me, is a really nice step forward. Um, we're absolutely making sure that social care is part of this picture. I mean, uh, NHSX's remit includes uh, digital transformation of social care just as much as uh, transformation in health. Um, we've got some sort of strong leaders working on it. We've got a brilliant commercial director in David Howey. We've got a fantastic chief technology officer um, in Dave Turner. Uh, we've got a, a brilliant leader for the shared care record in uh, Tim Donohoe. So I'm really confident we'll be mo moving fast on this. And, and fine. And I'm just I'm conscious of the time, Matthew. Um, I, I, I guess, you know, the kind of up sum is that there's a hell of a lot going on at the, at the moment. Everybody is super distracted. Um, you know, September, are you still aiming for September to have this sorted or... I mean, let's think about it. I mean, the Prime Minister is saying we're not going to be out of lockdown until, I don't know, probably March, April. Um, then, you know, we've got to kind of sort ourselves out. There'll be a huge backlog of elective procedures. Social care will be shot to pieces. We're trying to look after long COVID and vulnerable people at home and care homes will still be kind of sorting themselves out. That's providing the vaccination programme, you know, goes on stream and fingers crossed for that. I mean, this is a big stretch, isn't it, to get it by September? So look, the le for me, one of the key lessons of 2020 was in the pandemic, not only did we not, it, 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 we, we didn't stop digital transformation, we sped it up and we were able to speed it up because everyone could see it was important. And, and not just important, it was absolutely vital for patient care. So we got enhanced information into over 95% of patient records. We got some big shared care records set up in, a, a, I think, a really exciting way. We got GP Connect uh, to do much more of what we needed it to do. So I, th I think given that this is so important for patient care, we c just, people are massively busy, massively overstretched. But we've shown that even in the thick of a crisis, we can make this sort of change happen. We've also shown that when we really put our mind to it, we can make it as easy as possible for the front line. The centre can help rather than provide a burden. And I think if we, if we put the support in place, if we make it as easy as possible and straightforward as possible to do this, then we will be able to make progress by September. But we sure as hell won't be able to have finished it by September. No, and just very quickly, um, you were rolling out NHS email addresses for across social care as well. Is that still happening? 
Yeah, so huge numbers of care homes are now on uh, NHS Mail. As you know, we've sent out 11,000 iPads to care homes. We've helped uh, uh, information flow much more easily between health and care. Look, this is a mountain to climb and we're in the foothills, but we're making progress. Uh, Matthew, I, I'm really sorry we're out of time. I talked to you for much longer uh, uh, and perhaps we can on another occasion. Can I just say thank you for what you've done um, uh, over these uh, past dreadfully difficult months? Uh, I think you've moved IT on uh, more in the last four or five months than I've seen in the last 40 years. So congratulations. Um, my very best wishes to you and your family and please pass our thanks on to all your colleagues that are working with you at this very difficult time and here she is here's the real boss it's yeah. lovely to see she just popped up great to see you matthew thank, thank you roy thank really you appreciate much. it thank you